Why is it so hard for many pastors to maintain a regular devotional time with God? Gary Thomas is our guest this week discussing ways to keep our meetings with God consistent and refreshing. It's all in episode 63 of the Church Leaders Podcast. Welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping you lead better every day. And now here's your host, podcasting from scenic Colorado Springs, Colorado, Andrew Hess. Well, thanks for tuning in to episode 63 of the Church Leaders Podcast. I'm Andrew Hess, your host, and this week we're talking with Gary Thomas. Gary Thomas is the best-selling author and international speaker whose ministry brings people closer to Christ and closer to each other. He unites the study of Scripture, church history, and the Christian classics to foster spiritual growth and deeper relationships within the body of Christ. He's most well-known for his popular book, Sacred Marriage and Sacred Pathways. And now, here's our conversation with Gary Thomas. Gary, welcome to the Churchlers Podcast. It's great to have you on the show. My pleasure to be here. Gary, today we want to talk about, um, you've written a lot on the spiritual disciplines, on how we pursue God and strive to grow in our relationship with God. And I think a lot of pastors sometimes face a similar struggle where when day in and day out, you're in the Bible as part of your work, you're studying for preparing for sermons or messages that a lot of pastors feel like their devotional life is so intertwined with the work of their lives that it, it sometimes can become drudgery, or it, it's an area where they might say, I struggle. I, I don't feel the relationship that maybe I once did. How can pastors make sure that they're always growing in their relationship with God, even as they're under deadlines and they're doing a lot of what seems like academic work in the Word of God? Well, I've, I've found a few things that have worked well for me. The first thing I do is that when I sit down in my office in the morning, I have, I call it a Thanksgiving journal. I started it in December of 2014, and I'm still only halfway through the first book because there might be two words for every day. There might be a sentence, never more than two. It's not my regular journal. It's just before I begin the new day, I want to think back, what was the best thing that happened yesterday? Maybe a sermon really clicked. Maybe I didn't give the sermon, but it really came together. Had a great time with my wife. Had a great phone call with one of my kids. It's not always spiritual. But before I even begin a new day, I just want to begin the day with thanking God for what happened in the previous day. Psalm 108 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. And so I'm going to enter his gates with thanksgiving. And for me, just writing it down has been helpful and I got to tell you, it just, it lifts my spirit when I carry around this book where I now have, well, you do the math, a couple years, 700 things that I'm really thankful for, something that happens every day. Then I don't go straight into prayer. And I, I, George Mueller helped me with this. I think he's considered one of the most successful prayers of all time. I think most listeners probably know him, but if you're a younger one and it, it's kind of as older pastors talk about him, he lived in Europe, England rather, and well, he's part of Europe now, but he ran orphanages solely on prayer, had literally thousands of documented answers to prayer. It was not coincidence. I mean, he he prayed this and it was answered and he's got thousands of those. But he shocked people because he said early on he'd begin his day with prayer and it just wasn't working for him and he would be dry and it wasn't working. And he realized the first thing he had to do was to make his heart happy in the Lord. And so he began it with meditation. He would go into scripture And he would fill his mind up with the things of God or the glory of God. He would let scripture begin to direct him. And I do that. That's the first thing. I I go to my Thanksgiving journal. I open up scripture and I'm just reading. And it's not for the sermon. It's just for my own regular Bible reading that I'm doing. And I let that kind of dictate where I pray. And I don't have a certain amount that I have to get through on that. There's nobody that's testing me. I know sometimes people like to pray through the Bible in a year or whatnot, but I'm I'm just really trying to, if, if something really hits me, I'll just stop and think about it, and I'll do different things there. And then I go from that into reading the Christian classics. And I'm going back and forth from prayer of all of this. So I, I might be praying a little bit, or I might stop. And, for me, there has been nothing that has re-energized and keeps jump-starting my heart than reading the Christian classics. I I got started, well, if you can't see us, Lewis, uh, before college. Uh, 
I had a great teacher that turned me on to C.S. Lewis, and then I went to Regent College in Vancouver where reading the Christian classics was a thing, and actually my college pastor got me into Brother Lawrence and and, and some of the Reformed writers, and I, I got to tell you, it's when I look left or right, there's a lot of apathy toward God. He's sort of, people love him, but they're so busy, they're thinking about other things. But when I look into the classics, I say, Lord, I want that love. I want that passion. And a lot of them come from traditions very different than my own. They're not all evangelical Christians. And I might read some, and I've quoted him, St. Francis, and somebody came up to me before, Francis of Assisi, said, why did you quote an enemy of the gospel? And I was like, you realize, don't you, that it was several hundred years before there was a Protestant church after Francis of Assisi was alive. What else was he going to be? I love what God is doing and has done through the Eastern Orthodox Church. They have left us some great classics. That just yanks my heart, and it it challenges me. On ministry trips sometimes, because I often travel to speak, uh, Lisa and I have stayed at some incredible places, literally some of the best hotels in the country. But we've also spent our time in dives, <laughs> the no-tell motels in the small towns. And one time we were at one where had shag carpeting that I think had been there since 1979, a bedspread that was probably older. And my wife, you know, hygiene matters. And she's like, okay, Gary, put on a pair of gloves, <laughs> rip that. I don't even want to touch the bedspread. Just take it out. And she tried to jump onto the bed so that her feet wouldn't touch the shag carpeting. And then we got under the sheets and they're like bark. I, I, I mean, it's like, what, what is this? And, and, and I just said, well, maybe it's a marketing angle. At least how is this marketing? I said, exfoliate while you sleep. <laughs> I said, we're going to have such clean skin when we wake up in the morning. And it was a little bit difficult for her to appreciate my optimistic humor at that point. But, you know, I'm thinking I'm serving God and here I'm at this no-tell motel with bark sheets and shag carpeting that has probably meth residue in the bottom of it. And then I open up Gregory the Great, his homilies, his first homily, Gregory the Great, 6th century, just an incredible man of devotion and he, he gives a homily celebrating Felicity, who died in 165, just about a century after Christ. She had seven sons, all members of the faith. And uh, they wanted to make an example out of her. Marcus Aurelius was the emperor at the time, and you were supposed to worship civic deities. And, of course, she wasn't going to, and her sons weren't going to. So trying to persuade her, because she had she's a woman of some note, they basically gave her this option. All right, we're going to kill your sons until you recant your faith. And they went one, two, three, and she had a chance to recant, never did. And then, all right, you've got a chance because they, they really wanted her to recant. You can still live. We've, you've seen us. We're serious. We've killed all seven of your sons. Will you recant? She said no, and they killed her. And, you know, she died thanking God. She died thanking God that each one of her sons was faithful unto death and praising God that they would soon be reunited in heaven. Okay, that's ministry, and I'm worried about exfoliating sheets. I mean, it's just when I read stories like that, I'm just reminded what an infant I am spiritually. And I just, I just don't get that from contemporary books. And then, look, then I go from there, and I'm, I'm praying more. Whatnot, and then I, I'm always reading a contemporary book as well. Um, that might be sermon-related. It might not be. Usually it's not, but sometimes I'm, I, I'm not worried about too big of those lines. But when I start the day like that, when I'm thanking God in Scripture, reading a Christian classic, a solid contemporary book, man, I'm fired up every day. I really am. So that's how I get fired up on a, on a daily basis. Then for me, spiritually, I think one of my most memorable moments is when I'm at uh, Second Baptist in Houston. And I've, I've never said this publicly, and I, I shouldn't now because I don't want people to hear it. But one of my favorite, I'm a naturalist. If you're familiar with Sacred Pathways, different ways that people approach I love to get out of doors. This is why it's embarrassing that this one, one of my favorite places is this tiny patch of carpet right behind where I teach at Second Baptist. And I'll have to go there because usually people are in there. And so usually Friday afternoons are the best. Sometimes if I can't do Friday afternoon, I'll go in there early Saturday morning when it's still dark and they haven't lit it up yet. I just love praying on the place where I'm going to preach in front of this empty room. And I'm like, God, nobody is here. I'm not trying to impress anybody. This is just you and me. 
And I'm just asking that you'll, from this spot, that you'll feed these people, that you'll challenge me. And sometimes God really speaks to my heart about something not, not even related to the sermon. But there's just that connecting with him in private so that when I'm in public, we've been there. I'll, I'll look at that same spot and I'll walk onto that same spot and now I've got thousands of people in front of me. I've got hundreds of people in the choir behind me. And it's just sort of like this little thing that God and I shared, this moment of intimacy that, that God and I shared that has made preaching so much fun. This might sound sacrilegious, so please edit this out. Have your, <laughs> have your technician edit this out if you think this is going to totally ruin it. But it's like as a married couple, if you ever go away to a resort or you're at a conference or something, and in the afternoon or early evening, you come back and you just have a time of physical intimacy, right? You just decide you're, you're going to get together. And then you shower real quick and you go out to dinner and there's just kind of something special that you're around all these people in this very public place. But you guys just kind of smile at each other because you know you had a very intimate time before that. And just you and your wife know that and no one else will ever know that. And it, it's kind of, I mean, obviously it's very different, but it's like having that time of intimacy with God where I'm just connecting with him in private before I do something that's very public. And I, th- that might be particular to me because I'm such an introvert. And so it's like, I, that's kind of my self-defense. I've got to have that time with God before I'm in front of all these people and then doing all the small talk afterwards that goes with preaching at a church. Mm-hmm. Are there some uh, classics that have become your favorites that you return to? It depends on when you ask me. I've, I've read just about every one there is. I mean, because I'll find a list in somebody else's Thomas Kelly's book or Tozer will have a list or whatnot. I said, yeah, I read that, 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 that. And I go through stages. I mean, I've, I've loved so many of the reformed writers, uh, even some of the less well-known ones, Ralph Venning, The Sinfulness of Sin, and John Owen, Sin and Temptation, just the way of, of mortification and laying the groundwork to deal with sin instead of just being passive. I think, I don't know that, some contemporary reformers would be excited about that view, but the the classical reformers did. But then I'll go through times when I, I just get so much out of the Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, St. Theodosius or uh, Philokalia. I, I never know how to pronounce that, so if somebody knows I'm ripping it, I'm sorry. I just have seen it. I don't even really hear people talking about it. But then I'll go into periods, and this will, I mean, completely opposite from Reformed. I mean, I uh, what last year, I just spent a lot of time with, with Fletcher and John Wesley and some who, who really talked about Christian perfection. And look, I, I wouldn't use that phrase. And I think Wesley at the end of his life might've wished he wouldn't have used that phrase because he felt like he was trying to defend a word rather than the whole concept. It was such a rich time though, because what Wesley is really getting at is basically pursuing the place where you say, what if I don't want anger to have a part of my life? I mean, if I were to say to my wife, I will be mentally faithful to you nine out of 10 days, 90% of the time, I will not look at another woman. I will not think about another woman. I won't touch another woman. I'm just asking you to give me 10%, one day out of 10. No wife is going to accept that. As guys and, as, and women, sometimes we say, well, I'm doing so much better than most people. I, I can have the occasional thought. And Wesley would say, if it's sinful now, it's sinful all the time. Why do you, and I realized that I could just be complacent and just challenge me, pursue holy. I, I pray for God's provision. I pray for God to anoint my sermons and my work. I pray for his protection over my kids. Why do I not earnestly pray for more holiness? Lord, I, I, want, I don't want anger to rule how I treat anybody. I don't want to be envious of anyone. I don't want pride to impact what I choose to do or how I treat people. I, I want to be just as happy for somebody else's success. I, I came out of that season praying that if somebody rips me up unjustly, they attack me, they slander me, that I would be more concerned over the state of their soul than the harm done to me. See, I, that's holiness that I think Wesley was talking about. You're treating people. He's, he wasn't talking about this false piety, the following rules or the law. He was just talking about love for him was the capstone of it. And so what I love about reading the classics, I don't have to accept the systematic 
theology necessarily of the person. I'm reading for the spiritual inspiration, and I get that. I thank God that we have very well-equipped professors who read books to tell us what's wrong with them, and I'm grateful for them. They have a mind that's better than mine. I read books to find out what's right, and then I spit out the rest. Scupoli's book on spiritual combat is incredible. It is so rich, and it's you know, not very well known. And every chapter ends with a prayer to Mary. <laughs> and I'm just like, I get so much out of here. I go, and seriously, that's where he goes. But I, I, the truth and the light and my heart is revealed and the passion for God. And so I've just learned, you know what? I don't have to deal with that. I'm just, I'm going to take the great stuff and I'm going to let it go. So um, I, I wrote a book called uh, Seeking the Face of God, which was re released as Thirsting for God. And in the back of that, I have a list of the Christian classics that I quote from. There are probably two dozen in there that I go back. But some, John Climacus's Ladder of Divine Ascent, which is one of the earliest Eastern Orthodox classics, I've probably read five or six times. You know, I think Francis de Sales, I think Pascal's Ponce's uh, is something everyone I read. William Law is something to read. Uh, Teresa of Avila is great to read, particularly if men are listening because she's a woman and we're a man. She was from the Roman Catholic Church. Most of us probably aren't. She lived in Spain. We're here. She's from a different century. I think just seeing how somebody is so different in in every way. You know, Julian of Norwich, Divine Revelations is a popular one. I'm suspicious of that one. I just read it as poetry because she says some things that I'm like, no, no, I don't think that's a divine revelation. But then... There are these insights that are just like, wow. That's re-. So I, I read some of those like I'm just reading somebody's poetry. And I'm like, okay. So, uh, boy, I hate to mention names because then I'm, you know, leaving out so many others. Of course, Thomas Kempis, The Imitation of Christ, uh, is, is a great one as well. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of pastors who are hearing you are probably like, this is, that's great for me. Like, I would read a lot of those and kind of, be able to pick the truth out, but they would be hesitant to, to recommend them to their people. Is there kind of a caution to when somebody comes and says, Pastor, I'm looking for a fresh classic to read, do you qualify those recommendations or how do you do that with people that might not yeah. be able to? V- very much so. Number one, if somebody's dealing with legalism, I'm not giving them William Law, a serious call to a devout and holy life. All right, that would be putting fuel on the fire. Uh, on the other hand, if it's a complacent guy, Hey, William Law, you got to read him. If somebody's not grounded in their theology, there's some classics I'm not going to have them read. I'm, I'm going to want them to be settled in what they believe, pure doctrine, rich doctrine. Look, I believe doctrine matters. I don't want anybody to come away thinking that I'm reading all these outside of the— I, I believe you could go to hell for believing the wrong things. So I'm going to protect somebody's beliefs— and if they haven't done the work of studying basic theology, then I'm going to keep them within a tradition where they're not going to run into that, that kind of issue. You know, Brother Lawrence is usually an easy one to read, Practicing the Presence of God. It's usually easy to put into practice. And I would really recommend that people not get into Augustine right away uh, so often because it's the easiest to find. Okay, I'll read Confessions. That's one of the most famous classics ever, and it's true. Look, this is a guy who loves the classics. It's a lot of slogging for a little bit of food. I mean, I, I think now maybe I'm just missing it. I've read it, so I'm, you know, I'm there. And I think every Christian should probably read it over the course of their life. But it's not, I don't think it's going to energize you like other books might uh, to get people going. Blaise Pascal's Ponce's, it's really easy because you just, it's snippets. You know, it's not really a book. It's a collection of thoughts. You never got to finish the book. So you can just read this bit here and this, and you, you could stop at any time. Um, and that's a really easy one. Of course, Jonathan Edwards, you don't have to have any worry about the, the theology there. And I just think for basic inspiration, if somebody's feeling down, I say, you know, have you thought of John Wesley's journal? It's just so challenging because in ministry, we can feel so sorry for ourselves. Oh, I got so much to do. I got so much going. And Wesley was preaching three times every day, and he had to ride on horseback 100 miles to get there. And then he would be riding in the rain, and he got this and that, and he had this awful marriage. And, I mean, all of these things were going on, and he persevered. And so I'm like, okay, maybe I'm not such a heroic servant as I thought. So I would look at a guy's situation. That's what I love about being familiar with the classics is that if I know them, 
it's like a doctor that has 40 different prescriptions for headache. What kind of headache? Where does it hurt? When does it hurt? What makes it hurt? Okay, here you go. Take this one. And, and that's sort of like with the classics. I think that's why it's great for pastors to become familiar with them, not only for their own soul's benefit, but just so that they can prescribe to people and know what, what they need. Mm-hmm. When you have that morning meeting with God, what's the main thing? Like, what's, what's the thing you want to come away with? Like, what are you trying to do? I don't look at it in that utilitarian way. I just really look forward to it. I mean, I just, I mean, in all honesty, as we, I was driving over here, uh, obviously I'm not at home. We're in Colorado Springs, and I'm thinking, how do I set it up tomorrow? I'm already thinking about how I get it going in a hotel room. Just like when I go to a town, I'm usually planning where am I going to go for a run. Well, I checked in the hotel. Where's the good trails around here? And I, I guess I would just describe it as, as meeting with God, and, and that means it's different. Sometimes I might stop in the Scripture reading part, and I might just be working on a sermon, and it might be an hour or two before I come back to the Christian classic or the contemporary work that I'm reading. I really don't have rules for it. I kind of let, I, I think, the Spirit dictate what happens. Sometimes I feel like God really wants to speak to me. Sometimes if I try to force myself to hear something, I'm not hearing God. <laughs> I'm just getting angry with God that he seems to be so silent. Sometimes it is amazing to me how the scripture, the Christian classic, and the contemporary book will say the exact same thing. That happened just a few days ago. Like, all right, Lord, message received. I mean, because it, <laughs> it, it's, just, it's just too perfect that you've got a scripture that addresses it, a book that was written maybe a thousand years ago, a book that was written maybe three years ago, and they're, and, okay. All right. I I think God's speaking to me today. So, you know, I think if something feeds you, you look forward to it. And that's why I wrote Sacred Pathways, which deals with nine different spiritual temperaments, different ways that people connect with God. What I've described as my pathway would be what you call the intellectual pathway. It's very cerebral. I think it's just as legitimate a pastor might say, I'm going to meet with God best if I go out on the lake and kayak in the morning. Uh, There might be a pastor who's a sensate and he wants to bring the senses in. There's the activist and the enthusiast and I mean nine different ways. And so I don't in any way mean to imply that pastors should try to say, oh, this works for Gary. It's going to work for me. You might have a completely different spiritual makeup. When I look at scripture, different saints relate to God in very different ways. There isn't one prescribed pathway, devotional time. And so I would say find one that works because if it works, you'll work it. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't work, you're not going to work it. That's really good. That's so helpful. Thank you so much for for being with us today and for just sharing. I think a lot of pastors will be encouraged um, and, and even probably pick up some of the classics that you've mentioned that maybe they hadn't heard of or and it is important, like in your book, we'll put in the show notes. Do you have a place online where people can look? I at do. Uh, my website is GaryThomas.com. And if you go to the resources page and click, there's an article on reading the classics. And then I, I believe there's a bibliography in there where a number of the classics are read. So they don't have to actually get the book to, to get the introduction. Awesome. We'll link to that in the show notes. So thanks so much for being with us today, Gary. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks again to Gary Thomas for joining us this week as our special guest on the Church Leaders Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, it helps us if you take a few minutes to subscribe, rate, and review us in iTunes and consider sending this episode to someone you know who might benefit from listening to it. Also, you can make sure to download the show notes for this episode at churchleaders.com forward slash podcast. The show notes always include resources mentioned in the show and links to some of our guest top content on churchleaders.com. As always, if you have ideas for how we can improve this podcast or guests you'd love to hear us interview, Email us at podcast at churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next week. You've been listening to the Church Leaders Podcast. For articles, videos, and free resources that will help you lead better every day, visit our website, churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.